Welcome to Salon Talks. I'm Mary Elizabeth Williams. What a privilege. I'm sitting here with Lori Heltz Anderson. Did I do that right? You did. Nice oh, work. good. Okay, I was very nervous about it. She <laughs> writes books for readers of all ages. She's the Margaret A. Edwards Award winning author of Fever 1793, Catalyst, Winter Girls, and of course her breakthrough novel, 20 years old now. Speak. Now, as the book turns two decades old, there is a new anniversary edition with new material. I want to talk to you about all of that. It's mm -hmm. really exciting. She's also released a timely new memoir in poetry, and it's called Appropriately Shout. Hi. Hi. How you doing? All right. So I want to, let's, uh, there's so much to get into, but I want to talk about how this book came about because I read an interview that you did less than a year ago mm -hmm. where you were talking about Speak. It was in BuzzFeed. Right. And you said, I kind of feel like Speak should be renamed Shout. And then uh, a little while later you say on Twitter, I got angry again. Yeah. And here we are. So this came together very quickly. I was actually working on Shout at the time of that interview, but I wasn't sure that it was going to work. So I didn't want to talk about a new book because, you know, when you're in the middle of it, especially something new like a memoir and told in poetry. Um, so, yeah, it w that kind of leaked out a little bit in that interview. And that's, uh, Christy is a very good interviewer. Yeah, so what, how did this, but it, it, it does feel like this came about very quickly. Yeah. Well, and that I, you were, you had some stuff that was bubbling up. 20 years. For 20, <laughs> 20 years, years of, of, of simmering, right? Right. Um, and 20 years ago when Speak came out, which was a huge surprise, I never thought it was going to be published. But then it was published, and even more surprising, people responded to it quite nicely. And I began to receive invitations to speak at schools all over the country. And so for 20 years, I've been listening to the stories of survivors because I have never given a presentation at a middle school, high school, college, bookstore, anywhere, conference, where I haven't had at least one and often many survivors come up to me afterwards. So I've been absorbing all of these stories. Um, and what happened in the fall, October of 2017, as the next wave of the Me Too movement began, because remember, it started in 2006 with Tarana Burke, so that visibility that some of the women in Hollywood brought to it in 2017, then the backlash started. And it was the backlash that lit the fire for that book because I was so incandescently angry. Right. I mean, this is this is 20 years now, yeah. right? Like, I remember when this book came mm -hmm. out. I remember feeling like there was a, a movement. And there was. There was. And there is. And there has been progress. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sometimes hard to take that long view and yeah. see that we have moved forward in many significant ways. But also, oh my god, why are we still having these conversations? Right. Why are we still fighting these, these fights? Um, thinking of just this past year, the Kavanaugh hearings. Oh, yeah. Watching that, yes. and in the context of, of this story, your story, high school, yeah. sexual abuse, yeah. accusations of sexual abuse, that culture mm -hmm. around it. So when you were watching that unfold <sighs> last fall, yeah. what were you thinking? Um, I was restraining myself from throwing <laughs> the television out the hotel window. Um, but you know, I had a, for all, as frustrating as this can be, it, it has created moments of incredible light and, um, and education. I was in Colorado and I spoke to a woman that weekend, I was at a, a presentation, and she had a son who was feeling very enraged during the hearings for uh, Judge Kavanaugh, felt that his life was ruined by all this, and so she sat her 17-year-old son and her 15-year-old daughter down at the breakfast table, and was, they were the first people that she disclosed to about her rape when she was 15 years old. Oh my God. And you had better believe that was a powerful moment for that family. And I think that's the difference between 20 years ago and now. 20 years ago, uh, you had women of my generation um, who were confused and trying to figure this out. There was a little bit of a door opening. 1999 was the year that women came forth in the Air Force Academy and um, said, this has happened to us. And, and, and it was the first time I ever saw survivors of sexual violence being willing to put their face in the cover of a magazine. They said, no, we're not gonna, don't, don't shield our names. It is not our shame that we were assaulted. It is the shame of the person who attacked us. And so I think those of us who came through that year now were the next generation who are taking our place in, uh, on judge benches, in, in policy-making positions. 
Um, and then we've had this younger generation that is way smarter than ours. Oh, way, <laughs> way, way. And much more compassionate. They're now taking it the next step forward. And we're still seeing this, what, was it just last week, revelations about sexual abuse in the military, people oh, yeah. coming forward, oh, right? Yeah. This Absolutely. Is, this is women and you. Um, there is a part in this book, I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful book, and I want to ask you about the choice to do it in poetry, but the moment where, where you say, that was me, those three words, yeah. that's a real shift, and it, it recontextualizes the novel, it does speak. Well. So what made you... What made you say those three words, Laurie? I've been saying them for 20 years, but I've, you know, all these invitations I had to speak uh, to high school students mostly, um, they quickly, made, I, I thought when they first set me on the road that I was supposed to talk about literary devices, right? No high school student wanted to hear about literary devices, but they liked the book and the book speak. It opened up conversations that were needed to have, but then the kids started to ask me my relation to the book. And I realized that if I was going to talk about a book named Speak, I had to have the integrity to speak up. So I've been, the stories that you find in Shout um, about um, the, my father's PTSD and the pain that that caused our family and our struggles, and as well as me being a, a survivor of being raped at age 13, I've been talking about that for two decades now. And it came time to put it in the form right, of another book. Right, but to put it like, to put it in words, to see it yeah. in print. Very, You've been very open in your conversations, but yeah. to see it like that, I mean, yeah. it really did, Lori. When I saw that on a page, it just made me gasp. And I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I think that is a sign of how disconnected we are from what goes on every single day. A woman is attacked every 90 seconds in America, raped every 90 seconds. We all know many, many, many victims of sexual violence, male, female, and people who identify outside the binary, right? And, but we, we're just beginning to clear our throats and find the space, the brave space, to say, this happened to me. And the more we can do that, the more we can then have honest conversations about how do we change a culture that allows this to happen. Yeah, I mean, I think when that's it, because when you read it on the page, you're reading it in your own voice. Right, oh yeah, you're right. Right? That's powerful. Yeah, that's really powerful. Yeah. Because then you, it just becomes your story as well. Mm -hmm. It's your story, Right. but it's, it's our story. It's our story, right? It is. It's a big deal. Yeah. So why did you choose the medium of poetry for this? Well, when I had my moment on 11th Avenue in October 2017, um, I, was, I, was reading, I was listening to a podcast about the backlash, the misogynist backlash to the, um, the, what the women in Hollywood were saying about their own uh, experiences with sexual violence. And I was just ah, so <laughs> angry. And I, I've been writing poetry my whole life. My dad wrote poetry. And so lines of poetry started to drop into my head and I started to type them furiously on my phone. And by the, I was walking up to the Javits Center. By the time I got to the Javits Center, I called my editor and I said, um, yeah, you're not going to get that novel. I'm, I'm working on a memoir in poetry, which I'm sure just thrilled her. <laughs> <laughs> she's, but she's quite supportive. Um, and I think that there's two reasons that I wanted to do this in, in poetry. One is any kind of physical violence. That is a marrow experience. That is a trauma. Most people who experience any kind of physical violence develop PTSD and it's always there. Um, and so many people can identify with this. And so when, when you're putting together a, a narrative that's in prose, there's a lot of words that, that don't come with hammers attached. But in a poem, you have a lot of hammers. And also in between poems in a book, there's a, a space for the reader to breathe and to kind of sit with what they've just experienced in the poem. And that's what I really wanted to create. Yeah, and that is what you, that is the effect. Yes. You have this, and you go on this, this journey with you, and mm -hmm. then you come to this point in the middle where it happens. Yeah. And then you, you move out into something else. And it just like you feel, you, I mean, it's the sort of thing that's hard not to read all at once. <laughs> <laughs> it's all gonna be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but you go on this arc with it. Yeah. And it's really interesting. What's been the response so far? I mean, I know it's very early days. You're, you're still. Well, yeah, it's been pretty um, delightful. 
Um, and I, what's already really making my heart grow even bigger is hearing from people um, who've gotten early copies or, or um, who've read some of the excerpts online who said, that's my story. And now I'm going to talk to this person. That's what my secret hope for this book is that it will be shared. And I, like come Mother's Day, uh, let's all buy a copy for our moms and our aunties and our grandmoms. Because although... And our daughters. And our daughters. And have these conversations. You can have the conversation about the book, right? Without necessarily disclosing whatever you know happened in your past. But I think if we can all begin to talk about this, I know, I'm confident, I have total confidence that we can make even more changes. I always, always say that, that a book is a very safe mm -hmm. uh, conduit. I yep. have teenage daughters myself, yep. and I will just sometimes order them a book and then just do that, and then we can talk about it or not. Yeah. But it, there it is for the taking. Uh, because then you don't have to you don't have to deal with the like I your mother right and right this conversation. and then when that finger comes out and you stop <laughs> listening yeah <laughs> right yeah, that you're, never works then you're done so you know you're talking about open conversations and right. trying to you know trying to for, move the dialogue forward and yet mm. you speak has been a challenged book oh, yeah. for 20 years it is a book that a lot of people have tried to stop from yeah. being part of the conversation. You're constantly on the ALA lists. That's an exciting um, distinction for an author to have, no doubt. My daddy used to tell me that whenever anybody attempts to censor my book, I should write them a thank you note. <laughs> <laughs> because, because it creates a lot of publicity and my dad was all about the sales. Why do you think that is? Like, What is it that is so, um, so scary? You know, I used to get really angry when people try to censor my books because I took it quite personally. And now I understand, I've actually learned to really love the parents who are so confused and frightened that they think that censoring the book will protect their children because they love their kids as much as you and I love our kids. Um, but nobody's ever talked to them about things like healthy sexuality or, or sexual violence. And when I see a parent trying to censor a book, what I see the parent is really trying to censor is having to have an awkward conversation with their child. And you know what, you can, as a parent, you can kind of go, oh, yeah, I get that. Um, but what, what we need to be really clear about is that parents are making their children incredibly vulnerable, incredibly vulnerable. And I think a lot of those parents have still bought into the old myth that the rapist is always the bad guy in the bushes with a gun. And a ski mask. And a ski mask. Ninety-three percent of victims under 18 years old know they're attackers. Ninety-three percent. And when you get above 18, that statistic doesn't change too much. Depending on the source you look at, 75 to 80 percent of victims over 18 know they're attacker. Well, this is a big part of why I'm always fascinated with the idea that you can't let the con the onus of rape prevention has always been on victims right potential victims and what can we do to stop someone from raping yeah. and whenever you try to put it forward that maybe we should really have conversations about how to not rape it's like right. no 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 rapists aren't going to listen to that and it's like no because yeah. it's not the guy with a gun no. in a scheme rarely it rarely it's probably the guy down the hall in your dorm yeah it's probably the kid you go to school with or it's your swim coach or your friend or your cousin. How do we, and that is a conversation we can be having with people about what, what is consent. Well, you had that, there are lots of pictures of you with this great shirt that you like to <laughs> Got wear. Consent. Got consent. Got yeah. consent. Um, next month is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And this year's theme is I Ask. Um, more states are moving to a consent-based model in the judiciary that it's not about did she say no, it's did you get yes. And that yes has to be sober, informed, ongoing, and enthusiastic. Ooh. Yeah. So having, having your, part, your sexual partner not say anything, that's not good enough. You have to get an enthusiastic conversation. Uh, yes, and let's, like, this is what I want, and this is what I want. We can start, and we do try to start teaching consent to our kids when they're two right? You don't well, touch even, somebody. Even younger, right? Yeah. Like you hold a baby and yes. if that baby is like, no, 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 then. Yeah, exactly. We model that, but we have to continue that. 
I've had so many conversations with teenage boys who don't understand the impact of sexual violence. Nobody has ever explained to them that after being raped, 90% of victims develop PTSD. 20 years later, a large percent of those victims are still experiencing PTSD. And these boys just want to know what the rules are, what are the facts. And when you explain to them, this is like a big deal. This is a truly big deal. So many of them don't have parents that have talked to them about healthy sexuality, and they've gotten their information about what sex is from watching porn. Right. Where they see a lot of non-consensual sex, and they feel that that's the way it's supposed to be. And what I love about teenage boys is that they're awesome. And they just want somebody to explain the rules to them. And when you put out this information and listen to them and get their feedback, they're like, oh. And then so many of them, they want to become like the good guy, right? right. The honorable guy. Um, we fail them when we don't uh, tell them the truth. Lori, this is so important. I'm a mom of teenagers. I have teenagers all over my life all the time. Right. Teenagers are amazing people. They are. They are the funniest yes. people in the world. They're hilarious. Yep. They're so smart. They're so curious. And you're right, they do, like, for the most part, so many of them really do want to do right. They do. But we have this culture that is so insane that sets up sex as a negotiation. Mm. And the negotiation is that boys are always pursuing and right. always pushing right. and girls are always pushing back right. and that is I mean that is a very heteronormative thing yes. and that is I know that we're talking about male on female and certainly males are victims of sexual violence in a yep. way that affects them in completely different ways and yep. girls can be abusers all of that is very real as well but the dynamic of men pursue women resist right. is a really huge problem and we can talk about it. And when we talk about it, it changes. There was this big campaign in Canada, you probably know mm -hmm. about this, a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. And we saw a decline in sexual violence right. rates, like a dramatic. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing what happens when you give people information. Yeah. <laughs> Especially people who are at that really important emotional and an emotional intelligence growth point in their lives and their adolescence. Um, but let's remember all the intersections too, because on college campuses, the sexual assault rates of students who identify as transgendered is even higher than that of women. And let's always remember too that you know we're both very white women, um, but this is a crime that affects across all racial boundaries. Women of Native American nations have a profoundly high Exponentially. Uh, yes, and usually the, the, the men who are attacking them are non-native. Um, and so this, this is it's, it's such an insidious part of our culture. Um, and it's very upsetting, I think, particularly to older men, but also some older women who grew up with this as the norm. Mm -hmm. And, and to, to tell them that, no, actually, that was all damaging and wrong and we want to make it better, that comes as a surprise to some people. Well, it's so sad because it's so threatening. Yeah. And that's really, yeah. really sad. So I want to, we're talking about the need for open conversation. Mm -hmm. And that brings up something that is a very big topic right now in YA, yeah. the whole cancel culture. Mm. And I'm sure you've been paying attention to some of that lately, or maybe not. Yeah. But these debates about mm. who can say what. Right. And who has agency to say what, and if we have characters who are saying unsympathetic things or mm. who are villainous. That's not okay, mm -hmm. just in general. And I'm wondering how you feel about all of these debates that are going on right now about, about who gets to say what stories, especially with regard to YA and how you deal with that as an author. Um, I think it's very important to recognize that we are finally beginning, in children's publishing at least, and, and, and adolescent publishing, to look at the fact that our table has been limited to people that look like me, straight, cis, uh, white people, for way too long. And that's not a reflection of our audience. You know, we want, in the ideal world, all the books that are being published would reflect the world of our children, which is incredibly diverse in every single possible way. So um, we're trying to make sure, those of us who care deeply about America's children, that we're, we're bringing everybody to the table and we're adding tables on and making sure everybody's got a comfortable seat, that there's equity. Um, and there has been some really horrific examples of people writing outside their culture, whether that's ethnic background, religious background, um, and being, being very harmful. Um, so that the children who are writing, who, are, who identify as that character, let's say for example in a book, when that character is not portrayed accurately and respectfully, that's actually really harmful for that reader. 
Um, I think there's that the the power of, for example, Twitter um, can be a little bit over magnified, um, and and Twitter can be a pretty vicious place. Um, and there's that's a whole that's a, a whole other dissertation that, that's <laughs> waiting to be written or maybe being written right now. But we've had some incredibly important voices, uh, particularly scholars like Dr. Ebony Elizabeth Thomas from the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Debbie Reese, who have been really doing studies and doing the work to show us. Now here's what, what I believe to be true. And that is, is that you can write about anybody and anything. But when you are writing outside of your experience, outside of your lane, be prepared to do years of extra work years of extra work and, and to go extra way, extra miles. And if the thought of spending extra years on a manuscript is like, well, then maybe you should rethink your, your topic or your subject or your narrator. Um, artists are called to push boundaries. Artists are called to write outside of themselves. That's how we learn about other people. But we are called, particularly those of us who are coming from the dominant culture, the oppressive culture, for so long, um, we have to recognize how much harm our people have done in the past. And therefore, if we're going to write outside of our lane, which we should be doing, right? Because if you're going to write a kid that looks like an American kid these days, you're going to write about a kid who's got a lot of experience, if it's a white kid, a lot of experiences with people who are not white, who are probably not cisgendered or probably not Christian, which is why, how a lot of uh, straight white people identify. Um, so you have to do more work. And it's like, well, you also have to do work on plot and on character and on setting and themes. This is just another part of your tool bag as a writer. And if you don't want to do that, take up the guitar. <laughs> Why? Well, it sounds like writing novels is hard. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. I'm up for that. But guitar is hard too. Well, everything's right. hard. Everything's right. hard. Just, just, right? just laugh but a lot. But that's what's wonderful. That's too. what makes it worthwhile. But then you feel good. Yeah. And um, so this is so you don't have to write a novel. You can just read a book. And if you want to read a book, there you go. Read this one. It is called Shout, Lori House. Anderson, thank you so much for joining us today. What a pleasure. It's a brand new book. And you can also read the updated new version of, of Speak. Speak. Yep, there's a... Um, Get them both. They're yep. excellent companion pieces. Jason Reynolds wrote an amazing afterwards uh, for Speak, and Ashley C. Ford wrote a great introduction. Love her. Oh, love her, love her, love her. Big, big fan. So there's a, a lot of material. We have lots of things to shout about. Lots of things to shout about, lots of things to speak about, and maybe a few things to scream about. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think that's fair. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. Bye.